Welcome to the Reinventing Transport Show, the international podcast that helps you push for better urban mobility and better cities. In this episode, I'm speaking with Margarita Parra. She has a long track record of work on sustainable transport, but we focused mainly on her time at the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, where for the last eight years she directed the Foundation's grants to support sustainable and low-carbon transport. I asked Margarita to join me because of an interesting article she wrote in which she reflected on her efforts at the Foundation, aimed at reducing transportation-related air pollution and greenhouse gas emissions, especially in the United States, China, India, Mexico, Brazil and Europe. The article was published at the Foundation's website and was also picked up by WRI's The City Fix blog. I'll put links to both of those in the show notes. I learned a lot from Margarita, and I hope you will too. Enjoy the interview. Margarita Parra, thank you very much for joining us on the Reinventing Transport podcast today. No, thank you, Paul, to invite me to speak with you. It's, it's a great privilege. As you know, I asked you to, onto the podcast because uh, you wrote a very interesting piece for the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation website. So first, perhaps... For the listeners who may not be familiar with the foundation, can you give a short description of, of how it works? Uh, certainly. Um, the, the William and um, Flora um, Hewlett Foundation has been around for about 50 years, 52, and um, is a philanthropic endeavor created by the family, the Hewlett family, to really help solve social and environmental problems. Uh, I was part of the climate change program, um, which is part of the environment program. Uh-huh. And uh, they were dedicated, or they are dedicated to provide grants to nonprofits to support uh, causes that they believe on. Um, so our grantees uh, on the climate change program are organizations or, that are supporting climate mitigation, uh, mostly in China, India, the United States, and Europe. Okay, so the primary mode is to give grants to nonprofits who who are the ones who actually are working on the ground. Um, right. The foundation has increased its grant making in this arena of clean transportation uh, over the years that you've been working for them. Does this reflect um, your belief that transportation is especially important in the arena of climate change and carbon? Certainly. Uh, It reflects the fact that we've been, um, the foundation is committed to really uh, evaluate and monitor all the efforts and really adapt their strategies. And we know that transport is becoming the largest um, emitter in many countries of uh, global warming pollution. And um, it really needs uh, more attention and more efforts. Um, We reflect also the fact that even at the international level, uh, on the the Paris Agreement, most of the countries' um, contributions, the national determined contributions or NDCs, uh, they're mostly about measures on the power sector. But finally, some countries put forward some um, transport sector measures, and this is due to the community of organizations that we and others support as well. I understand you're also involved in SlowCat, and uh, SlowCat has been pushing this argument, hasn't it? Uh, SlowCat, I, I forget I forget the acronym. Perhaps you can spell it out. Yes, I'm a board member, a very proud board member of the Sustainable and Low Carbon Transport Partnership, SlowCat. Right, SlowCat. It's a wonderful acronym. Yes, <laughs> I guess um, for the listener, it would be interesting to know what was your role? Like, What, what does it mean to be a, a program officer in the climate change program? Yes, uh, uh, and this is a role that you actually don't learn anywhere else. I don't think it exists in any other industry. So I came to Hewlett as, a, as an activist, as an advocate, as an environmental engineer that I am working on environmental issues as an advocate and, and providing technical analysis. When I came to the foundation, uh, the role primarily as a program officer is to really set the strategy for which the foundation will provide the grants to the field. Um, so my role was to do this study, which I shared in my blog about if we want to solve the carbon problem in transport, this is how we should do it. And I will do also a landscape of organizations that are working on the field and I will recommend funding for them. And then, of course, that will become a docket and the docket will be approved by the board um, and so on. 
So the role of the program officer is really to know the field, which is a, was a very privileged position for me to learn about uh, who is doing what, what are the governments doing, what are the business doing, what are the NGOs doing, and then recommend um, funding to support the gaps or to support the, the areas that the foundation felt needed help. Ah, fascinating. So it, it sounds very challenging. You have to be both a strategic and policy thinker as well as a, a manager and someone who's uh, attentive to detail and monitoring the, the grants and all of those practical things as well. Correct. And um, it's challenging, but also very rewarding um, to be able to provide grants uh, and then see the changes on the on the ground was something that was so satisfying and I was very, very happy I had the opportunity to do that. Uh, the foundation is very generous. Uh, I didn't mention, but perhaps it's, it's worth noting that the Hewlett Foundation is, uh, maybe as of now, it may change one of the larger uh, philanthropic supporters of climate change mitigation efforts. Uh, we've been the largest for a long time, although now there's new foundations coming, but our program dedicated uh, 100 million a year, uh, a year for climate mitigation. And... Um, and it actually has grown. Uh, last year, on the board of the Hewlett Foundation approved additional uh, money. So it's been it's a very steady and, 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 and also large um, contribution. So you mentioned that early in your tenure at, at the foundation, you had to devise a strategy for curbing carbon emissions from the transport sector, of course. This is an area other people have worked on as well, but you you distill it into an interesting two-part strategy. Could you talk about your two-part strategy? Yes. And I'll say that, I, of course, this is something that um, I base on the work that many have done in the field. I think you may have heard of the avoid, shift and improve uh, framework as well, which actually we used to at the beginning at Hewlett. I brought up and it was something that many NGOs and, and many transport practitioners, including in SLOCAT, were also implementing. Um, but we, um, throughout the years of refreshing our strategy, go down to this too. Um, and I will say that they're very carbon focused. Um, maybe people notice it's really carbon driven. And I will say that that's a characteristic of the, of the Hewlett program. Uh, we know that there are other pollutants that are important too and that um, those pollutants affect maybe cities more like uh, particular matter or uh, into X or into O, uh, others of those uh, who are also part of the fossil fuel uh, combustion. We're actually just focusing on CO2 because we primarily believe our goal is to help mitigate climate change, um, but they are always related. So yes, these two, one is to really... Um, we know that to move peoples and goods, we need fuels and energy. And so far, primarily 90% of our fuels to move peoples and goods are uh, fossil fuel based. And we know gasoline and diesel and bunker fuel and jet fuel. And those have to be decarbonized. And um, some are easy to uh, decarbonize than others. Uh, but electricity uh, is one of the ways to move um, and those vehicles more efficiently. And of course, electricity produced with zero carbon energy and we, we should emphasize that too okay so that's one that's one yes correct with with electrification as a key step in the decarbonization process okay correct next and next uh, which maybe some people will change the order that's what i'll say but we put it second because that's how we believe we can impact the system better is to optimize the efficiency of the overall transportation system and this is where maybe some of the avoid and shift strategies could be um, uh, included. This is how we make sure we really move um, all our goods and, and people uh, in a more efficient way, try to reduce the number of vehicles and, 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 and overall efficiency. So you're alluding to the fact that there's a little bit of controversy and that in the sustainable transport scene, you've got different viewpoints on how much to emphasise decarbonising and how much to emphasise the the optimising and the doing more with less kind of theme. But um, it's very interesting. You know, you've got both, of course. And, um... They're both very, um, you're right, they're both, um, they have a little bit of controversy and you could say we lead with the first one or we can lead with the second one. And we did some modeling um, and when we were doing our strategy about how fast we can impact change or how, how fast we can influence change. And both of those things are very difficult, we all know. Um, but given that um, there is a more 
efforts on decarbonizing fuels for also production of power, we think that decarbonizing the fuels for transport could follow. And in that way, when we're thinking about electrifying, we're not electrifying just transport sector. Many governments are involved in electrifying everything, as they call it, which also includes buildings and even part of industry. So be, because of that, because it's more integrated, that power and transport sector, power and building sector, power and industry, we put it first. But it's not to say that it's not as important uh, because we know we need both and both are necessary and also very difficult to achieve. Yeah, it's a, it's a complex area, isn't it? And uh, from what you say, that sounds like a pragmatic approach, especially with the rapid progress on uh, on the various technologies and the, the the rapid decreases in costs for for the electricity industry. So that's an opportunity. Exactly. Uh, and we all know that uh, restructuring cities and their whole transport systems is is a long term endeavor, very important, but s relatively slow in its in its outcomes. So I, I can see your point. Yes, you, you really summarized it so well. That was what we faced when we decided this strategy and the one and two. And the two is very necessary, but you're right. It includes a longer term span. Uh, it involves more actors as well, uh, local governments, state lo governments and national governments. Uh, whereas decarbonizing fuels, it, it's still complex, but I think it's, it's mostly about, as you were saying, the technology uh, diffusion and the technology cost Um so, yes, uh, very controversial. I will say in a personal uh, note that I think we need both. And I myself have been more committed uh, over my long career on the second one, <laughs> working on public transport. But I see how important is the number one. Okay. Let, let's get a little bit specific then. Um, you've, you've been a grant maker and administering grants f for, for Hewlett. Do you have any favorites or... or if not, if not favorites, <laughs> ones that you like to talk about. Yeah, well, um, we should not have favorites, I think, <laughs> as uh, maybe like uh, parents think about the, the, their children. Um, but it's hard not to have favorites when you have areas of passion. And I think my blog, um, I highlighted um, the Institute for Transport and Development Policy, ITDP, which I know you know well. And I also highlighted the WRI Ross Center. Um, and these two were one of my favorites, um, some of my favorite um, grantees and organizations, because their mission really resonated with my own personal mission. And as you know, both of them work mostly on the optimizing the efficiency of the transportation system. Mm -hmm. They mo work mostly on cities and how we move uh, people more sustainable in, in cities. The I ITDP, I'll say, I know him for a very long time. Even in my previous life, when I worked in an NGO called ECLE, Local Governments for Sustainability, which is also, it also has a, a, um, a transport program called the Eco Mobility Alliance. Um, they're also one of my favorites. Of course, I work there. Yeah. <laughs> um, so when I worked at ECLE, we worked with ITDP because this was the early years of um, what now we know as a very well uh, established technology, the bus rapid transit. In the early 2000s, Bogota was building um, the BRT network. We were supporting cities, um, really exchanging information about best practices. This is when I was at ICLE. So we came across ITDP as, as a very uh, knowledgeable organization on transport. And I grew a fan of them. And when I then moved into the foundation world, I was very happy to be able to uh, support their efforts, which were really to build uh, BRTs that were high quality, that were really gold standard, but also they innovated a lot. And I highlighted um, the work of uh, ECOBC in Mexico City, where they also supported the, the BRT. But this ECOBC, I think, was very uh, revolutionary. Could, could you explain what is, what is ECOBC for those who don't, are not familiar? Yeah, so ECOBC is, an, an, uh, is the bike sharing program in Mexico City and EcoBC is like a, I think, a, a short for like green bicycles, um, you know, BC is a, a, the short for bicycles uh, in Spanish. And it's a partnership between the city and the private sector and it's the largest bike sharing system now in Latin America. And that's docked, docked bike share rather than these yes. new dockless ones, right? So it was a little, it was a few years ago before the dockless ones appeared. Exactly. Have dockless bike shares appeared in Mexico City? Are they, are they sort of competing with EcoBC? 
I believe so. I believe Mobike has um, some had launch operations in in Mexico City as well. Um, I don't know to the extent that they are actually complementing or not. I, I, this project was actually a few years ago, so but I think it will be interesting to see that question. Yes, interesting to watch. Yeah. By the way, uh, you just now mentioned uh, Bogota, and uh, I, I could have mentioned that you're originally from Colombia, right? Yes, I'm from Bogota. Mm-hmm. You're from Bogota. <laughs> so embarrassingly, two times in a row with the Reinventing Transport podcast, we'll have someone from Bogota just by coincidence. <laughs> I know. And I know well Carlos Felipe Pardo. He's a really <laughs> thought leader in our field and yeah, I'm very proud of what he has uh, achieved in Colombia. A theme in your reflections uh, piece was how rapidly things are changing. And just now we mentioned uh, Douglas Bike Share is one example of an amazingly rapid change that's happened just in the last uh, two years. Which changes and innovations in this arena do you think are most important or mo- and most promising perhaps? Mm, that's a great question. And some of those practices, I think, um, you know, bike sharing, as we were saying, or car sharing, they're practices that existed before. But what has revolutionized that and is changing the landscape is the technology that we are using to identify uh, the trips, to match trips, to you know, to connect the user with the vehicle, um, demand and supply. I think that to me that revolution of the, I would say more of the software, right, has been fantastic. Like I do ride sharing to go to the airport, for example, and that's something that I never thought I would do here in in, in suburban <laughs> Silicon Valley. Um, we have Uber Pool. And I think that to me um, is really um, revolutionary. And this happened because of the advance of IT, smartphones, applications, and of course, entrepreneurs who were willing to, to try, of course, like Uber um, and Lyft, but others in the world um, like Didi and Ola. Yes, it's interesting, isn't it? There are podcasts and blogs and uh, writers in North America who often talk as if Lyft and Uber are the only ones, but actually you know, every big country has its own version of uh, these things. Didi, Ola, uh, Brazil has one, doesn't it? 99. I mean, I'm in Southeast Asia. There's Grab and there's uh, Gojek. It's, it's remarkable. Yes, and to me, those variations are all important because actually they are more tailored to the local um, communities, right, to what people uh, reward more uh, when they want to share rights. You mentioned the rickshaw challenge uh, as one of your examples. Yeah. Is that something that is also IT enabled? Yes. Um, so this was also one of my favorite projects to participate because um, the Ross Center was really being innovated and, and they had a staff that were really creative uh, on this urban revolution and urban transformation. Um, and they decided to support um, the first and last mile connections to transit. And we know in India, they are mostly done by these three wheelers, the rickshaws. So their idea was, uh, could the service be optimized? Could the service uh, improve? Could we move more people with maybe less vehicles if we have also an algorithm that helps? And if we have some support for those drivers as well, because most of those drivers drive individually. They're not part of um, cooperatives or, or anything like that. So this first accelerator was bringing together new companies or new cooperatives of auto rickshaw drivers and to provide them with the training and the possibility of having their own app to run and to get to their to their clients and and so this was in 2013 or 14 so it, for the the standards of today that was really a pioneer uh, work that evolved and continues to to be implemented in India it's difficult to keep track of all of the things that are happening, isn't it? Yes, I agree. And this one, for example, and if I believe correct, the city that they award the, the auto racial challenge, I think there were various cities, but I think the first one was Bangalore. And we know Bangalore has now, for example, committed to all EVs on their buses. Um, so I do believe that um, electric buses, the uh, cities who to have some interventions in one area, for example, this one was on the first and last mile, um, that helps the city to build on that and to really go further. And then we go into electrification of vehicles, which uh, we know is of high order, uh, because right now we don't have a lot of production of those vehicles, right? We don't see them around. They're very, as I wrote in my blog, only 3% of vehicles in the whole world are electric. 
and we still don't see them all the time. So it's very hard, and, and, and that requires that vision uh, of, of those governments. And just one demonstration of one of those sustainable transport solutions, I think, is very helpful. You're living in Silicon Valley, and um, the, the theme is, uh, of course, innovation. And we were just talking about uh, the, these various kinds of innovations and the opportunities was my first question, but the second obvious question is to ask about threats and uh, challenges to overcome perhaps th with these innovations. Um, many cities have been struggling with some of the uh, un unwanted side effect of, for, for example, dockless bike share is, is remarkably promising, but has its, has its negatives. Uh, the, the ride hailing like Uber, Ola, Didi, they, they are remarkable in how they've eased certain problems, but they've also perhaps uh, in, increased traffic in, in certain contexts. What do you see as, as some of the principal threats and um, challenges that we need to be wary of? Every culture is different, and I will say that uh, things that may work in um, Chinese culture, for example, um, there they may be the parking of bicycles in the in the public space is not something that um, is as maybe as badly seen as in other places. And we know in the U.S., we're very happy to see lots of cars parked on the road. We call them the dockless cars. <laughs> we don't really, <laughs> yes. we don't really care if they are there. But if you see dockless bicycles on the street, people will wonder, right? Like, why are they doing that? But what I was going to answer about the complexity, which you asked me, which is true, is that I think one of our main challenges with these technologies is to um, to think about how our system is changing daily, I think in New York City, but I will say here in the Silicon Valley, we have higher congestion. And this is not only due to the to these new companies, because they are really just um, matching a demand. Really, our economies are growing. The Silicon Valley is growing really fast. So we have to look at those policies, I think, in an integrated way. It's about economic development. It's about transport. It's not just DNCs. And, and to me, um, it would be very blind just to do one policy about one type of transportation mode. It's all about everything. And we need to improve the, the train service we have for the long commutes, the high density corridors. We have to improve um, ways to have more bike sharing and um, dockless share bike shares to get to the last mile, first mile. And we also have to look at housing, which I know WRI and ITDP and others have been very good about. We still have to build people houses near uh, where people work, um, or transit-oriented development, or housing near transit, so that we know people can use those modes best. Yeah, the the issues are, are different in their details from country to country, place to place, rich and poor, but but they tend to rhyme, don't they? Yes. Totally. Um, this is an area where, uh, um, uh, you know, one thing that is very common to all of us in all these countries is traffic congestion. Policies that may not work, uh, that may work well in some places, for example, uh, mobility pricing. We know it's, it's happening in some in some settings. It's very hard to make it happen in other settings where people are not used to pay for, for roads. And the United States is one of those examples where we, it's, it's going to be very hard to implement congestion charging. Um, but we saw it implemented in Asia, in some cities, and of course in London. Being in the carbon area, um, are carbon taxes or ca carbon-related pricing, was that ever part of the transportation portfolio? Yes. Um, we do uh, support the different pricing mechanisms. Uh, it's only that there's been uh, – I think the foundation, as I mentioned, follows the field. And, and as you know, pricing has been a field or, or – the practitioners of this is something that has been slow coming. But I have to say that in the last um, couple of years before I left Hewlett, we started to support more of those efforts to ensure that um, there's always advocates at the different venues, making sure that policymakers know their options, not very, very maybe popular. <laughs> but uh, if we actually charge the right fees for the use of the roads, um, that will have a, a better outcome. For everybody. Let, let's go back to the issue of uh, electric vehicles for a moment. You were you were quite optimistic in your piece that EVs have um, reached a point where they're, they're growing very, very rapidly. W would you say that that is now at the point where it's primarily market driven and that's just because they are actually a really good option in many situations or is it still 
something that's driven by public policy and, and carbon policy, climate change policy? Oh, to- it's still d- driven by, by policy and mostly um, carbon policy, to be honest. I, I really hope we were at the point that the market will take over. But no, we still depend on those incentives uh, from the policies. So in, in the electricity scene, it, it's almost at that point in, in many markets, especially places that are rich in solar and wind. But on, on the EV side, it's not yet there. Okay, interesting. Okay, so that's your judgment as, a, as someone in the area. Yes. Okay, I'll, I will respect your judgment. <laughs> I hope I'm wrong, but uh, maybe countries like China would be maybe the only one because they have an industrial policy of producing those uh, millions of electric vehicles and they are incentivizing their own industry. I may say maybe the industry will take over and will sell them as better cars, but right now the momentum, and I will say, is still uh, is, is a small momentum uh, on EVs, um, but it's very vulnerable, uh, I will say. Uh, okay, so industry policy is another arena that pushes this in addition to climate policy. Yes, yes, correct. You mentioned China's new energy vehicle mandate. How was how was the Hewlett Foundation involved in that? We have a big partner there called the Energy Foundation China, which is based and registered in China, and they provide support uh, to the different uh, government agencies when there is gaps in knowledge, when there is need for some new information. So, uh, on this uh, particular uh, policy. We've been supporting a program um, at the Energy Foundation China uh, called Clean Transportation. We know China has a commitment uh, with uh, air quality because we know the air quality is very poor. Um, We know we have heard about the air apocalypse, which was a period where the air quality was so bad. It really was a wake-up call for China about how important it is for them to uh, clean the air. And transport is one of the areas they're looking at. So, uh, we could play a role by supporting all the needs to implement the policies they wanted to, to clean the air. And this is one of the, the policies I think I believe they have put forward, uh, having new energy, uh, cleaner vehicles. Yeah. That kind of brings us full circle, doesn't it? Because mm-hmm. we started near the beginning, we were talking about these two strategies, the decarbonization and the, the efficiency one, the optimization one. And this idea that there are co-benefits or you know side effects of doing something on carbon, but you have side benefits or co-benefits such as cleaner air. And uh, transportation seems to be one of those areas where it's particularly rich in co-benefits. And I, I guess that's nice in that it brings together the two, uh, the two uh, parts of your strategy. That's right. And, and and I think it's, it's important to say, and I, this was also my work when I was an advocate, when I worked in Brazil many years, uh, people did care about climate change, but their immediate priorities were about, of course, health or even, uh, of course, jobs and, and, you know, access to their jobs. And uh, so I think transport is such an important sector because it really connects everything. Um, and we do need to have access to housing, to health, to jobs, and that's through transport. And everybody needs clean transport um, because it also affects their health. Um, so it's a, it's a sector that really is like intertwined with others. And when we support advocates, they're very wise in every country to have entry points about what people care the most and get their support for the policies that will then ultimately get the overall benefit. I guess it's a sensitive topic for people in the development world or development professionals uh, experts, technocrats, um, we, we often get accused of being anti-democratic and imposing you know, our, our idea of what is best on others. And uh, so it, it's, in, it's, it's good that you, you mentioned that we have to find out what are people's priorities and we can help them to achieve their priorities. We, we don't That's necessarily right. come, come as a top-down expert. So well, there is expertise involved in this delicate balance of um, doing the right thing, but at the same time meeting people where they are with their own priorities. Is that something that you've struggled with? Or, or Yes. No, Paul, this is a very, very interesting point. And I believe the fact that I'm a foreigner and living in the U.S. and, and I've been here very, very um, lucky to have been landed in this country, but I'm still um, foreign born. And I do feel that that helps um, because I can connect better 
with other, of course, with Latin America, where I'm from, I, and I led our Latin American program for a while, and then we shift towards China and India. So yes, I, certainly that's a challenge, and I think we still need, in this very globalized world, we need people who have that ability more than ever. I usually ask at the end, is there one thing that you want the listener to remember before we say goodbye? No, oh, there's so many things I would like people to remember. But to me, if I have one thing I want people to remember is that transport is a sector where we can connect all these issues of our day, right? We we have these very young populations who want to innovate. We have, of course, uh, people who depend on, on transport for jobs. We need to have our goals on, on transport. Uh, we all want to have sustainable development and have uh, also goals in alleviating poverty around the world. And I do believe that um, transport actually has the opportunity to fulfill all those goals on sustainable development, on climate change, on prosperity in cities. So that's maybe one thing I want people to remember. It's been wonderful talking to you, Margarita, and thank you very much for being on the Reinventing Transport podcast. No, it's my pleasure, Paul. Thanks so much for inviting me to speak and to share what I have learned these last eight years, maybe the last 20 years. Don't forget, you can always go to reinventingtransport.org for more information, to listen to other episodes, to find out how to subscribe or to leave a comment, suggestion or question. Go to reinventingtransport.org. This has been the Reinventing Transport Show and I'm Paul Barter. Thanks for listening. Bye for now. Bye.